and where it's basic understanding and um uh and then yeah and then i will introduce everybody um and yeah and then i'll pass to you first avia and then i ayatomi and then chelsea am i pronouncing everybody's name correct avia for me yeah uh -huh. yeah cool. all right so um yeah, Joe, uh, are you happy to start? Yeah, happy to start. Yeah. So the event is live now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Hi everyone, so I'm Imani Robinson um, and this panel um, is very exciting. It's about prison abolition and we have some really, really wonderful speakers. Um, just to let you know that this session is being recorded and it will um, then be made available by Goldsmith Student Union on, on various social media channels, which I'm sure they will update you about. Um, I'm gonna get right ahead and um, kind of introduce this topic um, in my own words, and then I will introduce the rest of our speakers. Um, and then we'll move on to um, a couple of presentations and then a little bit of time for discussion. Um, I can see that you can only see me in the video and that's fine for now because I'm the only one speaking. And I think it'll be whoever is speaking at what time will be the, the person that you can see. So, I'm going to get started. Abolition is our only path to safety, carceral logics and the prison industrial complex. The prison industrial complex or the PIC can be understood as an interconnected web of carcerality, capitalism and state control that seeks to punish behaviors and activities that threaten its own continuation and expansion. Through its reach and impact, writes US-based organization Critical Resistance, the PIC helps and maintains the authority of people who get their power through racial, economic, and other privileges. There are many ways this power is collected and maintained through the PIC, including creating mass media images that keep alive stereotypes of people of color, poor people, queer people, immigrants, youth, and other oppressed communities as criminal, delinquent, or deviant. The PIC itself produces wealth, or rather maintains the inequalities that allow for capitalist accumulation to persist through the forced inactivity of people in cages and the state-sanctioned or extra-legal production and exploitation of group-differentiated vulnerability to premature death, also understood as racism, and that's uh, Ruth Wilson Gilmore's uh, definition. Carceral logics require us to believe that in order to create safe communities, we need policing, prisons, surveillance, and punishment. In other words, the criminal justice system is constructed as an essential framework for how we understand what harm is and how to respond to it. But the criminal justice system does not tackle the root causes of harm. Instead, it sanctifies crime as a metric from which to gauge the morality and goodness of people, because the lives and behaviors of good people respect the authority of the state and commit to its continuation. Bad people conversely threaten the continuation of the state with their actions, beliefs, and behaviors. Instead of developing the tools and the language to be able to resolve conflict and understand the root causes of harm, we give such a capacity away to something outside of ourselves. We look to carceral logics to determine how and when individual people will be punished, so it's out of our hands. This is a problem because our relationship to the state precipitates a collective and learned helplessness for which the antidote is a focused and intentional commitment to collective power, mutual aid, community care, tools for resilience, the deep and difficult work of conflict resolution, healing, and finding more sustainable and effective ways to respond to harm when it does occur. But so focused is punitive justice and carceral logics on punishing the individual for breaking a rule, so ill-equipped to address the root causes of harm, that our capacity to think and understand harm as collective rather than individual is deeply compromised. 
collective power is not possible within the logics that frame collective social issues as solely individual problems. Cultural logics undermine our capacity to develop strong empathic relationships with each other and to practice the hard work of conflict resolution in our everyday lives, alienating us from our own experiences and understanding of harm and our capacity to both cause and heal from it. This moral framework that is based on protecting wealth, on protecting ideal notions of humanity and unchecked institutionalized state control over people and behaviors, produces a set of crimes instead of harms and enforces punishment for those crimes as the correct and only way to respond to such behaviors. Instead of addressing harm itself, punitive justice and the logics of carcerality that makes such a framing of justice possible responds with punishment when somebody has broken a rule as opposed to responding when harm occurs. And that kind of framework is taken or borrowed from the, the Aorta Collective um, who wrote about punitive justice and this idea of the law being something that kind of uh, facilitates this breaking a rule instead of kind of really responding to harm um, back in 2013. Um, and it, this has become the kind of common sense notion of carceral safety. So the prison industrial complex has been set up to define harm in particular ways that protect some interests like property and racial capital and abandon others. Um, I want to take this opportunity to introduce some of our speakers who will be speaking kind of more uh, in depth about kind of the specific areas that they're working on. And um, it's, it's a real honor to be facilitating uh, this group of people. So um, our first speaker is Dr. Avia Saradeh. Um, Avia is currently a lecturer in criminology at Birkbeck, University of London, as well as an activist in the Eastern chapter of Sisters Uncut. Sisters Uncut is a national direct action collective fighting cuts to domestic violence services, as well as state violence. Her research interests are survivor criminalization, our survivors criminalization, transformative justice and prison abolition. Before academic life, they held a number of frontline domestic violence service roles, including working as an independent domestic and sexual violence advocate, refuge, refuge worker, and uh, national domestic violence helpline worker. I just wanna shout out Avia um, that some of the first times I ever understood or heard about um, uh, abolition and prison abolition and, and uh, the possibility of living otherwise, you were in the space. Um, thank you for your work. And I'm gonna pass over to you and introduce others before I pass on to them. Um, but yeah, thank you. You are much appreciated by many, many, many people. So what do you have to say for yourself? interesting how much things have changed over the last few years because you know I wasn't always a prison abolitionist and I was working and thinking and doing activism in the world of violence against women for a while before I actually came to these ideas around prison abolition and even though I was always very skeptical of the police um, I hadn't really gained that kind of radical imagination of what it would mean to address violence in our communities without prisons and without policing. Um, so yeah, I kind of, yeah, I want to talk a little bit about that and, and about my research and about um, activism more generally on this. Um, but yeah, um, before coming to work at Birkbeck and before doing my PhD, I was working in as um, an independent domestic and sexual violence advocate, as Imani was saying, um, was saying. And a lot of what I was doing was very like criminal justice focused. I was, as IDVA is the common term um, that is used, it's kind of a role that came about probably in the last like 20 years. Um, and as a kind of alternative um, to refuge work. And, you know, it's, the main thing that you're supposed to be doing is getting more more people more survivors through the criminal justice system um with the intention of you know the more 
they um, stay with the system, stay with the process of, of, of um, the criminal justice system, the more perpetrators can be convicted and that is supposed to apparently um, bring about eventually an end to domestic violence. And obviously it doesn't really work like that, but that's the intention of, of part, a quite great part of my role. And even though like, I had to work with the police quite closely, so quite a lot of the time, I was always quite skeptical of that. Like, um, and most of the people that I worked with, most of the survivors that I worked with did not want a criminal justice response. Most of them wanted um, housing, needed a refuge space, were in danger. And even if they didn't want to leave, most of the time they just wanted the violence to stop. They didn't really necessarily think the police would be able to do that for them. And, and many thought that actually the police were likely to make things worse. And that was the recur recurring kind of message I was getting from survivors who I was supposed to be trying to encourage to stay with the criminal justice system. And some of them even ended up getting arrested themselves rather than the perpetrator or alongside the perpetrator. So, you know, when I um, started to do my PhD research, it was at that point that I started to try and reflect on like why you know why is this and you know initially I was kind of looking for is there a way to use the criminal justice system positively um so yeah I definitely wasn't always a, um, a prison abolitionist and then it was actually through my PhD and through my activism with, with Sister Sankar that eventually my answer was no <laughs> <laughs> so yeah um what I um, actually found was, you know, essentially like these were not accidents that a lot of the survivors that I was working with were being arrested and were facing arrest and were facing, um, um, were facing, you know, oppression from the police. It wasn't just like an unintended accident. Um, it just was part and parcel of the way the criminal justice system works and what it's there for. And, um, and it, you know, through this period, I would say that um, I managed to be quite like lucky in the fact that I was doing activism that kind of complemented what I was researching and and what I was um, working on and I'm very very grateful for that because like you know it's not always easy to be able to create, get this symbiosis between um, activism in, in grassroots struggle and also being in libraries with dusty old books usually those two things are supposed to be separate um, but I was really lucky that I got to be able to learn and and do direct action and and these things kind of came together and again with with you know Sisters Uncut it was initially set up in you know when austerity was really starting to you know in my, in my role as an IDVA it was absolutely unimaginable what what survivors were facing and what we as workers were having to try and navigate in terms of the institutions as, as austerity was really starting to impact uh, people's safety in terms of their housing, in terms of their ability to um, get um, support in civil courts, like no legal aid, all of these things were absolutely coming crashing down. And so Sisters Uncut was born out of that kind of time period when um, services were being shut, housing um, was dwindling, uh, still is, mm -hmm. um, and so it was a, a kind of resistance to that, to try, and, to try and put state funding of domestic violence services and the things that survivors need back on, back in the, you know, on the agenda. And actually through time, all of us like kind of started to um, expand our understanding of what it would take to for survivors to be able to survive um and um whereas you know initially it was very much that like reinstate that funding we started to understand that actually there were parts like my my job as an idva that were being better funded than say the housing and the and the other you know the refuges and things like that criminal justice initiatives were being funded and there were you know, as I started to learn more, I started to understand there were reasons for this and like understanding more about the neoliberal agenda that came out in the 80s that was very much about stripping away the welfare state, stripping away housing benefits, all of these things that most survivors actually say they need, mm. the things that they say they need to survive, they, they say they need to leave violent relationships were being stripped away and that money was instead being put into the criminal justice system. 
and you know that was part of this kind of like an ideology of 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 of, of um, anti welfare but pro law and order a law and order agenda on domestic violence and actually really um, the politicians were like very cynically using domestic violence to essentially um, to bring in this kind of law and order agenda, not because they particularly cared about survivors, but because it, it actually acted as something that was very useful uh, politically to sort of say, we're doing something for women on domestic violence and what we're doing is we're gonna lock up all the perpetrators. Mm. Um, and, you know, actually, yeah, it was very cynical and it's not something that survivors wanted. It's not something that domestic violence services wanted. Um, most of them were not necessarily saying that all of the answer is the criminal justice system, but that is what the political priority in domestic violence has been in this country um, and in the United States uh, politically for the last sort of 30 or longer years. Mm. And yeah, that's that's a lot of the reason why, you know, when I'm after learning a lot more about that and, um, and in my own research, like finding that actually the people that were most impacted by this kind of law and order agenda that was supposed to be arresting all of the perpetrators was often um, working class survivors, migrant survivors, black and LGBTQ survivors um, who were more likely to be arrested actually and criminalized. Um, and including in that sex workers as well, or anyone involved in, in things that the police don't think they should be involved in, were actually more likely to end up being arrested through these initiatives. And, and that's really the point where I kind of decided like there is just, if any part of me thought that there could be like a good criminal justice response to violence, I just don't think that there can be. And that's when I started to get, become more interested in um, other alternative ways of of um, of addressing harm because the the harm in our communities is there. It is real. It's something that I grew up around a lot of um, as a kid, and is the reason why I want to, I do what I do. I want to do what I do. Um, and so transformative justice and and like sisters uncut people became more interested in transformative justice as an alternative way of addressing harm that rather than punishing um, punitive responses that rely on the state using um, apparently its monopoly on violence to lock up people that they, they decide need to be locked up because it doesn't work. And I've found working with survivors for many years, you won't find many survivors who said that it worked or it was something that they wanted um, so instead of that, instead of that punitive response, trying to actually address things at the root. And for me, you know, transformative justice is quite different. You know, we often hear things like restorative justice. It's a bit different than that, where you kind of imagine restorative justice, where, you know, the person who um, has perpetrated harm sort of apologizes to the victims and, and goes through this process. Whereas transformative justice is actually something that is um, a lot more radical and a lot more getting to the root of the problem. And so like, you know, why is this person behaving this way? Like, what is going on for them that they are perpetrating violence? And that could mean uh, in terms of um, the violence um, that they have experienced. It may not be the violence that they've experienced. It may be other like material, other things going on in their life. Um, and also addressing the, what the experiences of the survivor is through that as well and I, I genuinely think that it's very very difficult and since I've committed my life to this is it's very very difficult it's not an easy challenge but I do genuinely think it is possible to um to in the right structures if we transform our structures in our communities to um addressing this proactively I do think it is possible for people to change mm. and I do th I genuinely believe and I actually have seen some examples of people's capacity to change with support and with love and that is ultimately what um, most survivors I've ever met um, want is is for the, the violence and the harm to stop and to, for things to get better yeah and yeah I think that is the only option we have <laughs> yeah thank you 
I think what I just wanted to to kind of come back on is um I think I think carcerality and and the, the prison industrial complex and the idea that prisons work right the idea that that punishment is the only viable response to when harm happens has so embedded in our common sense right Angela Davis talks a lot about this talking about how um the common sense notion of safety is a carceral one. So it, it, it really is, is, is difficult for people sometimes to think about an alternative because it's been so normalized, right? That when um, harm happens, that somebody needs to be punished, somebody needs to be held accountable by being sent to prison. And I think that a lot of the time people's immediate responses to this idea of prison abolition is, okay, well, what about, you know, and the, the saying goes, what about the rapists and the murderers? Um, and I think that a really useful way um, of kind of thinking about that question is, is to ask a slightly different one and to ask the question that abolitionists are maybe asking, which is what do we do about murder and sexual abuse in general, because the prison industrial complex, because cr the, the criminal justice system, because carcerality and punishment are not actually solving those problems. Um, and so I just want to kind of um, you know, offer it back to you to, to expand a little bit on, on what you've said and really talk, speak to, you know, you're, you're coming from a space where you're working about on domestic violence and you're trying to really um, transform that harm and transformative justice is an approach that you're taking. And do you want to just um, respond to those people who would say, well, you know, what do you mean there is no, there's no prison or there's no punishment? How, how is that going to work? Maybe just speak a little bit more about, about how you would respond to that. Yeah, it's a really, really good question. And it's something that even though now I'm more certain of how I feel about what does and doesn't work, you know, I haven't always felt this way. I haven't always thought about things this way. But I think if you expand your understanding of the way in which uh, harm actually operates in reality um, then it, you realize that actually what we have clearly isn't working it clearly isn't containing these these um, instances of, of extreme violence of murder or of of of, of sexual violence um, you know and like one of the things that's come up this week is the no more exclusions got a lot of heat on Twitter um, for basically saying that you know they wanted zero exclusions, even in instances where people have perpetrated um, sexual harm. And, you know, people just could not get their head round that you wouldn't exclude a child who had perpetrated some kind of sexual harm to another child. Um, and people saying, well, you know, they need to be locked up, they need to be locked up. And when you think about that, you, you know, what you're actually saying is, well, my, I don't want my child to be, be harmed, but I'm quite happy for that person to be locked away and either harm themselves or do harm to other people. Because frankly, one of the biggest um, and most sexually violent institutions in the world are prisons. So that does not stop sexual violence. It clearly doesn't work. Um, so I, anyone who says that it does, even, even on the level of containment, even if you're gonna say, well, we can't stop them being a perpetrator, but we can contain them, it clearly doesn't contain um, the perpetration of sexual violence. It just moves it somewhere else to a different group of people, which presumably society says they don't care whether sexual violence happens to them. Um, and if you start to care about those people, then you kind of got nothing left but to say, well, clearly this, this kind of way of doing things doesn't work. I would say, you know, it, that is going to take a radical overhaul of um, the way in which our communities work and respond to harm, not to the point of not like waiting till it gets to that point, but in terms of the way we interact with each other, relate to each other, um, we need a, a radical overhaul of, of what our communities look like. Um, and I know like, you know, in um, the Bay Area, in the States, quite a lot has been written about things like pod mapping, really, really useful practical tools that can help you understand a bit more proactively um, how you can think about who are the people in your life that um, hold you to account, who are the people in your life that, you know, will just listen to you when you need to like get stuff off your chest. And actually it's based on the kinds of things that we already have in our communities and our lives. 
you know, I often like to think of the example of like, you know, if your cousin uh, stole something from you or did something wrong to you, would you immediately go to the police about that issue? Or are there other people in your family or in your networks who you would talk to bef way before you got to that point, or assuming that if, if you ever, you know, would you go to your auntie or your uncle or your mum or another cousin to kind of do deal with that and sort that situation out? Um, and the sort of pod mapping stuff kind of builds on that, that we already have those structures, but we unfortunately at the moment, they're not ne necessarily well supported. They're not particularly well resourced. So if we shifted our attention towards those, those things in our communities that we already have and properly resourced it and were proactive about it and say, right, we're gonna not deal with things through the criminal justice route. We're not gonna deal with things through being punitive, but we're gonna use the networks and the, and, and the things we have within our communities already. I'm gonna properly resource it then I think, you know, personally, I feel like that would have a way better chance of being able to much more effectively address harm than moving the problem somewhere else to be perpetrated against someone else. Absolutely. Thank you. Now, um, you know, that's really brought up this kind of question of, um, you know, what safety is and what safety means. Um, and I think that, you know, the, the common sense idea of safety is kind of melded with or um been replaced by or um kind of usurped by this by this weaponizing of the state um in order to protect us and um and punish others um and so you know in in the context of um sex work which we're now going to start kind of speaking about um that's also a kind of really clear arena um, where there are kind of the people who are doing harm and the people who need to be protected, right? Um, and and this, this idea that actually most people want safety for themselves um, uh, is kind of brought into focus. Now, I wanted to introduce Ayutomi, um, a black queer disabled student and activist representing SWARM, which stands for Sex Worker Advocacy and Resistance Movement. They have been involved in various types of organizing and activism spanning seven years on issues such as sex and relationships education, intersectional liberatory politics, and sex worker rights. Um, and so, <laughs> Ayutomi, I wanted to invite you to kind of respond a little bit to uh, what has already been said. Um, and, you know, I'm thinking a lot also about like, you know, what is, what do we want uh, for our communities? What do we want um, in terms of our relationship to harm and, and our relationship to capitalism and our relationship to the state? Um, and I think for sex workers, that is a, a really important conversation. So, um, you know, you're not representing all sex workers, but you are representing Swarm and, and what does Swarm want? Hi, um, thank, I just want to say thank you for inviting us um, to be able to speak on this. I think that there's a, um, there's a very, um, there's very big opportunity, um, not opportunity, but um, yeah, I would say like opportunity to um, really link the work that sex workers have been doing for honestly decades. Um, with the work that abolitionists are trying to do in terms of um, imagining a future without the castral state and without castral politics. Um, so I guess I wanted to start off with um, just a tiny bit of background that I personally have a particular interest in public health, specifically how um, social inequalities and economic inequalities actually impact the health outcomes of individuals and populations and communities. And I'm bringing this up because it's going to become very relevant to what I'm going to um, talk about. Um, I know that some, I know that some have, some research has been done on, you know, uh, the effect on prisons on various types of health, including mental health, disability, sexual violence, um, as I'm pretty sure most people know, like how prisons have contributed to the COVID-19 outbreak. Um, but I, this is what got me, what got me interested um, a very long time ago in sex worker rights was the, um, the public health um, views on like sex work legislation, essentially. 
Um, and I thought it was very interesting that actually a lot of um, epidemiologists, a lot of people who study public health, um, even up to the level of the WHO or a lot very popular recommendation of decriminalization of sex work. And that's the term that sex workers use to describe the removal of um, the state essentially from regulating sex work, whether that's criminalization, whether that's granting sex workers licenses to practice, whether it's controlling where sex workers can move um, within countries or across borders. Um, decriminalization is like, you will have no involvement at all in our work, um, in our spaces, in our organizing, just nothing at all. Um, and the public health argument is, uh, it's quite complex. It's mainly linked to HIV transmission um, that when there is decriminalization actually has, it actually has the effect of lowering um, HIV transmission in sex work, uh, sex worker populations and communities. Um, so that's very, this is very interesting because um, we're in a situation where a lot of um, feminist organizing is specifically looking at other types of legalization and that can be liberal feminists who want to see what's called legalization, which is when like sex work is permitted by the state, but the state has to permit it and it has to permit it in a certain way. So you can only practice certain types of sex work um, only citizens and only people native to the country can practice sex work. So let's say like migrants can't practice sex work, um, things like that. You can only practice it in licensed venues, um, et cetera, et cetera. And on the other side, you have various criminal like criminalization models. Um, obviously like there are certain types of sex work which are criminalized and legal in legalization, but under like criminalization models, it's more a conversation of um, who in the sex worker and client um, relationship gets criminalized. Um, very popular, um, very, very popular um, model is the Nordic model in these spaces where the clients of sex workers are the ones who are criminalized. Um, and that can span from having being fined like several hundreds or thousands of euros to actually going to prison for um, seeing a sex worker or solicitating services of a sex worker. And it's like most sex, most or, um, sex worker rights organizations which are actually sex worker led. So as in, um, you know, actually controlled by sex workers. If there's a governing board, that board is going to be like majority or all sex worker led. Like, groups like that are very anti, very, very anti, the Nordic model for a lot of reasons that um, Avia has already basically talked about. Um, the idea that these clients who are obviously like going to be categorized as straight cis men, these clients, these men are bad men and the sex workers are good girls who need to be protected from the bad men. Because of that, we are going to punish the bad men and put them away so that they can't um, they can't harm the good girls anymore and, and we've done a very good thing in saving the good girls from the bad men and that's very much the narrative around like that's very much the narrative around like the Nordic model until you know the pesky sex worker rights organizations pipe up and be like actually that's not what we want um, and then you know we get dismissed or harassed we get accused of being pimps um, we get accused of all sorts of things because, you know, we've actually spoken up against their narrative and their logic that the problem with the problem with sex work is that it's bad men harming good girls. Um, sorry, I just need to get my notes up again for a second. Um. No worries. <laughs> no, um, thank you for that. I think um, I think that um, often 
people see a situation like uh, sex work or like drug use where they, uh, you know, don't agree that it should be criminalized and so they ask for legalization and I think that this is an also maybe an important moment to to talk about the difference between um, abolitionist steps um, and you know reforms that really make it impossible for our goal of abolition to happen um, and so oftentimes it's decriminalization that is kind of the most urgent goal. And that's definitely true for um, drug policy in this country and elsewhere. Um, and it's definitely true, I think, also for, for sex work. And I think that sex worker organizing has for a long time led um, this kind of movement for, for full decrim now, um, rather than asking for legalization, where, whereas sort of, I, I work in drug policy and the, the movement generally is starting to um, become clearer about its demands for decriminalization, for removing punitive sanctions, for um, acknowledging that the criminal justice system um, is not uh, not the arena within which you know the, the drug use and and and, and um, harm reduction should take place, um, but actually um, it, it needs to happen without the punitive justice system, and I think that the same thing um, is really being modeled by by sex workers and their advocates um, and I wondered if you could talk a little bit more um, about decriminalization and its relevance to abolitionists so as an abolitionist how can I show up for sex workers um, I'm very happy to talk on that especially because um, swarm are very explicitly clear that we are for the decriminalization of like drugs and substance use as well because um, of the similar issues regarding stigma criminalization, how it disproportionately affects uh, black and brown populations, how it disproportionately affects uh, disabled populations as well. Um, so that's something I'm more than absolutely more than happy to talk about. So the real problem, I think, with having a criminalization approach to addressing sex work is that it doesn't um, it doesn't really affect, it doesn't address the concerns that sex workers have about sex work, you know, about having to compromise on our boundaries and safety practices because of economic pressure. Criminalization does not do anything to address that. Um, so, sorry, could you, um, uh, it was about, uh, well, what just, can do for abolition. Sorry, I have quite bad memory, so I need no, to no, that's remind okay. <laughs> That's okay. I, um, I mean, you can speak about whatever it is that you want. We have a couple of minutes left before we need to move on. But I just, I just am saying, um, you know, there's like T-shirts printed uh, that say legalize drugs, right, or legalize weed, and actually. Um, the people who are most impacted by the war on drugs, for example. Um, are actually calling more and more for decriminalization because that is the most urgent policy demand. That is a kind of reform that we can make right now um, that will bring us closer to this horizon of abolition. And so as abolitionists, how can we support sex workers? Um, and I think that you've already kind of outlined um, that decriminalization is, is the reform that sex workers are demanding. Um, so I just wanted to give you space to, to to kind of expand on that and to talk about that as as the urgent reform that needs to be demanded not only by sex workers um, and and uh, organizations like swarm but also by all abolitionists um, who are who are kind of wanting to kind of create this this much safer um, uh, and much more liberatory world okay that that's really helpful thank you for um that extra clarification um the reason why decriminalization is so urgent in the field of sex work is because we are seeing more and more economic inequality as um, we approach late, well, we go further into late stage capitalism and further approach end stage capitalism. Um, and that is very much something that hits sex workers particularly um, hard. And what decriminalization means for us is that it makes it easier it makes it easier for us to work with each other it makes it easier for us to organize in ways that we already have independently of the state um 
supporting each other um, when it comes to drug use, when it comes to transition, when it comes to mental health issues, when it comes to surviving domestic violence. This is work that sex workers already do. It is difficult work to do because of the pressure of being a sex worker in a okay in the UK where criminalization is not to the same level as it is in the Nordic countries or definitely not in the states but we don't have a model of legalization like Germany does and we do not have the level of decriminalization that New Zealand does um but it's uh sorry um in terms of support, I suppose it's about looking at um, looking at what sex workers say the concerns are, um, where it is how um, certain groups of sex workers are more likely to experience violence from client, not just clients, but also from the state than others, and looking at the organising that's done around those sorts of politics. Migrant sex workers are a brilliant example of this and one of the groups that need decriminalization the most. Um, we talk about New Zealand a lot, but even in New Zealand where sex work is supposedly decriminalized, migrants still can't practice sex work in New Zealand legally. Like that's the exception to decriminalization in New Zealand. Um, and <laughs> sorry, it's, um, I was going to touch on the hostile environment as well, because when sex work, when migrant sex workers are targeted by that, that has a rippling effect on all women who are migrants, who are suspected to be migrants and who are subject to the hostile environment. And decriminalization is one of those immediate reforms that would immediately um, put an, essentially not put an end, but it would lessen the impact of the hostile environment and all of racism and xenophobia and colonialism on marginalized women because um, there's no longer a reason to punish and forcibly extradite um, essentially sex workers, women um, for working. On Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's so many ways that someone might want to uh, be involved in or become a sex worker. And one of them is definitely to um, survive capitalism. Um, and on that note, I just want to introduce um, our third speaker. And thank you so much, Aotomi, for, um, for your words and your research and your experience and your insight. Thank you. Um, Chelsea. Chelsea Jackson um, is an abolitionist and a political scientist um, and an activist scholar uh, from Decatur or GA USA, which is Chickasaw lands of SE North, um, uh, North America, which you might want to explain a little bit more to the people. Um, a political scientist, a penal abolitionist, her research is in the intersections of race, politics and crime, uh, which led her to, university, to the University of Oxford. Her activism has stretched from student organizing with the ATL BSU to Mothers for Justice and Roads Must Fall in Oxford. Ms. Jackson is a transformative justice facilitator with the Cradle Community, a collective of activists, scholars, and artists finding ways to make space for curiosity, compassion, and creativity. Cradle is a transformative justice project developing and experimenting um, in the skills we need to build uh, to support abolitionist approaches to collective care and healing in in our communities. Um, and just to kind of draw a thread from what we were just speaking about to, um, to what you might go on to speak about, um, what's what I also find interesting and, and dangerous um, about liberal reforms um, or kind of reforms that seek to expand the state's um, capacity to have um, ownership or surveillance over people's behavior and activities. Um, is that um, you know something like legalization, for example, in Canada, cannabis has been legalized, and um, there's also been several uh, several tens of so almost 100 um, new criminal laws uh, to criminalize specific use of cannabis that is sort of outside of the legal market. And so, um, as a penal abolitionist, as a political scientist, I wondered if you could speak a little bit um, about the dangers of relying on 
the legal system of relying on um, the penal system to really bring about anything other than what we already are experiencing, which is this violence, which is this kind of total encompassing carcerality um, of the criminal justice system um, and yeah, capitalism. Yes, so thank you so much, Imani, and, and that's a perfect um, sort of segue into an idea of how I became an abolitionist. It, it was this very realization. So to kind of go back and explain where I'm from, I'm from Decatur, Georgia, which is a Black um, neighborhood outside of Atlanta. And the reason I say that it's the Chickasaw lands on Southeast North America is because the United States of America is an idea. But North America and the state of Georgia, where I'm from, that land belongs to the Chickasaw people. So I'm not Chickasaw, but everywhere I go, I want to make sure, you know what I'm saying? That that, that land is recognized because that's whose you know, people are buried there. So even looking at how how we get from, for example, a legalization conversation versus decriminalize and how different those two things look. It's really about how involved the state is. So I kind of want to use a metaphor to talk about this, where uh, a lot of people have heard this statement, it takes a village to raise a child, right? So if it takes a village to raise a child, then the village is the child's parents. It's the whole village. But the state is not a village. The state is a group of institutions. But we have the state in a position of disciplining or punishing or controlling or setting the rules, setting the lines, deciding who gets what, who gets paid what, who lives where, right? And so when we've moved the village out of the power seat, we've taken away from the village the ability to make those decisions and it rests with the state, the outcomes we get are not gonna be parent-like outcomes, right? They're churning out outcomes that are beneficial to, as, as folks mentioned earlier, capitalism and the amassing of wealth, right? And the maintenance of the system as it is. And so if you think about a parent, a parent might discipline you, but discipline is not the end goal you know, a parent is trying to teach you. Education is the goal. Even if I'm disciplining you, it's for the purpose of teaching you something. And so your parent might put you on punishment. They might restrict your movement to help you think a little bit, but they're not gonna starve you and beat you and put you at risk for sexual abuse and make you pay exorbitant rates to talk to your family on the phone and keep you from seeing your children and, and keep you in shackles and lock you in a cage and call you by a number, right? Your parents wouldn't do that to you because your parents love you. So they might make you be still for a little while, right? And think about what you did or maybe clean up the vase that you broke. I know the metaphor I'm using seems a little maybe too light for this, but I think sometimes bringing it down to that level helps us really understand what we're doing. We're turning the state into the parent and we're saying it's okay to lock a person in a cage because they acted out, because they did things you didn't like, right? And so thinking about abolition is about uh, exactly what Dr. Avia brought up earlier. It's about imagining a different world. It's about having a radical imagination. So when we think about things like marijuana, before there were laws that made marijuana illegal, the Bedouins in the desert were smoking marijuana. The Folks in Papua New Guinea in the jungle were smoking marijuana. The people in the Congo were smoking marijuana. And they were all fine. They were fine. And then, you see what I'm saying? And then we create laws. So then decriminalizing is not about, you know, getting free from all these laws that we made. The solution is not to make more laws. That's what legalizing is, right? Decriminalize says, let's take those laws away. Let's move, let's move the state out of these issues and give it back to the village. Give it back to the village to decide where and when it's okay. So when it's not illegal and you don't have police officers in the park running those young men away who are smoking, you know, maybe they smoke it outside next to the basketball court, but instead you have the basketball coach or the principal or the pastor 
or the deacon or, you know, the woman who works in the bodega. And she's coming out like, now y'all know it's kids out here. Y'all don't need to be smoking that, right? And, and how, how are they gonna respond to that person who's a part of their community? And so when we take that power back, when the village takes back the power from the state and says, no, these are our children, these are our young people, these are our you know, communities and we own them. Not that we own the problems, right? But that we own these communities and, and this is our village and we have the right to speak up. So for me, getting from political science into abolition actually came from starting from studying the civil rights movement and really trying to understand how are they so successful? How did they change all these laws and you know get all these things in place? But in the process of almost being a fangirl of the civil rights movement, I was also learning how unsuccessful the movement was, all the things that didn't happen, how segregation, and, and I'm American as everyone can tell from my accent, but how segregation in American schools is worse today than it was in 1950. And it was worse in 1950 you know, it was worse in 1970 than it was in 1950, you know? So seeing that things didn't work out, but we have all these new laws on the books. And then who are the people that are behind bars when it comes, whenever there's new laws, who goes to jail? Who, who ends up in cages? Who gets locked up, right? So seeing all these things come together makes me begin to question the system of law, legal system, the, the constant, like, I'm, I'm wondering if, if, if laws and public officials are trying to make things better, but it's disappearing all these people into cages and then disrupting entire families, entire generations, then how is this going to work? And similar to Dr. Avia, uh, I originally was thinking about how could we work inside the system? How could we reform? Maybe we need more, you know, judges of color and police officers of color and prosecutors. You know, we just need more people from different class backgrounds who can understand, you know, why somebody would break into the bodega and steal because they've been hungry before. But if you have a judge up there who's never experienced hunger, you know, this, I, I don't understand. You're just a criminal, right? But what my research and my evidence showed me was that even the people with a shared background, in order for you to get up on that bench, you had to leave a lot of stuff behind, right? In order for you to put on that uniform or put on that robe. And so even if we have people who look like us or people who come from the neighborhoods we come from or have the backgrounds that we have, as long as the, the cockpit is set up to drive you into prison, it doesn't matter who's sitting in the driver's seat, right? And that's where we have to think about transformation. And so for me, abolition and transformative justice is really just living out, trying to build the dreams that my ancestors dreamed about, you know, trying to trying to be an architect for what freedom could look like in our world. Because I know certainly it can't be, you know, locking each other up and calling really anxious people with guns and uniforms to come and handle our social problems. That's not what freedom is, you know, there's got to be something bigger. Thank you for that. I think um, I think one of the things that um, is really important is to recognize that um, yes, we're interested in this village, right? But I think for a lot of people um, who have only ever experienced the lack of a village, right? Who have only ever experienced, um, you know, not having a community to keep them safe. Um, that it, it, it's hard to make that leap from um, believing that that's what is needed to actually understanding what that takes, to understanding that that is possible um, and to practicing those skills. So before, um, before we kind of move on to um, some kind of broader questions for the group and then some questions from the audience, I just, I wanted to ask you to speak a little bit about, um, yeah, in a world without prisons, which would necessitate a world with, without prisons, um, without police, without detention centers, without surveillance, without those buildings, but also without those um, uh, kind of ways of being that allow punishment and carcerality and coercion and capitalism to uh, really structure and, 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 and organize our lives. In a world without those things, you know, 
how do we begin to live uh, and create those villages right now? And I know that's what you're doing with Cradle Community, but I, I wondered if you could just, just draw that link because there's not an abolitionist I know out there who, who isn't aware that, that, you know, it's, 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 yes, we need to dismantle, but we also need to build. So I wanted to just, um, yeah, in a world without prisons, how do we build? Yeah, and I thank you so much for bringing up this point because when most people hear abolition, it's just about getting rid of something. But for me, abolition is about building. Like the contractor who you hire to come in and, and build a new mall, he spends like five minutes tearing down what used to be there. And then all the rest of the time is pouring the foundation and doing, doing that. So for me, the first step of building an abolitionist world is getting rid of the frame getting rid of the phrase, it's none of my business. It is your business. It's your business. It's your business. <laughs> Dr. King said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. It's your business. If somebody's being harassed, if somebody's experiencing violence, you are experiencing violence. You are being harassed. You wanna know why? Because you're not safe. During the Holocaust and World War II, um, Jewish writers taught us, right? First they came for them, then they came for them, then they came for them. And then when they came for me, it was nobody to stand for me because I didn't stand with nobody else, right? So the reality is, it is your business. If you're on the bus and somebody's racially terrorizing the bus driver, you should say something. Even if it's just, hey, that's not okay. That's being an abolitionist. You want to know how you want to know why? Because you've turned that bus into a justice space. Just you being there has introduced justice into the space because you're going to help justice along. You're going to say something. It's not going to be okay with you if you're sitting at the bar and people are making racist jokes or if you're, you know, with a group and someone pulls down someone's hijab, you're not just going to be okay with it. You're not just going to laugh uncomfortably. You're going to make it clear yo, that's not cool. And it is my business. I hear my neighbors are having a dispute. No, maybe I'm not going to go over there. Maybe I'm a little nervous. You know, maybe I don't want to just go over there and knock on the door. But you know, maybe tomorrow I could go get two of my other neighbors and we could just make some lemonade, you know, and then go knock on the door. How y'all doing? You know, we just wanted to bring y'all some lemonade over here. Make sure y'all doing all right. You know, things like that, because it is my business. And it's more my business because they're my neighbors than it is Thames Valley Police's business. So I'm going to call somebody who's not from my community, who doesn't know either one of them, who has a gun. I'm going to call them because it's more their business than mine. No. So when we get rid of that, it's not my business. And we push out a bubble of justice everywhere we go, every friendship group we have, every space we're in, right? Every job that we work, we're pushing that out. When you're at work and somebody's saying, oh, you know, I, this guy looks a little shifty. Let's, let's call security. Just go talk to him. Maybe he's hungry. Maybe he needs, you know, maybe he needs a place to sit down. Maybe he doesn't he have a home and he just needs to use the bathroom for a few minutes, but he's trying to work up the courage to ask you. Instead of calling the police, go talk to the man like a human being. That is being an abolitionist. So it's those kinds of things we can do every single day in every space that we're in. That's not necessarily about protesting or changing law or screaming, but it's about taking that power back. And the thing you said, the very first thing you brought up about people who don't have a village, the way to have a village is to create one, literally. Because I noticed the more that I'm nice to people, people are nice to me. The more I speak to people, the more they speak to me. The more I smile, like I've, I've made friends with taxi drivers just from being in the back of the car and smiling. We get off on the topic and we're talking and we're talking. Next thing you know, he's inviting me to dinner with him, his wife and six kids, right? Those type of things, the more we're present and see each other as human beings, the more we can create that world. And we, we increasingly need less and less to call in outside people to handle our business. Thank you. No one a little over. No, thank you. Thank you, Chelsea. Okay, so we have a little bit of time for questions now, but whilst um, you're all maybe reflecting and thinking about what you'd like to ask this very esteemed panel, um, I'm going to ask um, Dr. Avia and also Ayutomi to just see if they want to reflect on anything that's been said to, to kind of um, have any kind of final remarks before the questions. Um, 
you know, there's been there's been such a rich conversation, um, you know, like for between me and each of you. But if you have any questions for each other, this is also your time. Um, I also wanted to just point out that this is specifically about prison abolition, this this kind of panel and this conversation. Um, and I, I think um, sometimes it's useful to kind of specifically talk about prisons or policing or surveillance or different aspects, transformative justice, conflict transformation, community accountability, you know, there's all of these um, topics within. But I wanted, I wanted also just to throw out there that in terms of prison abolition, you know, um, if we're starting there, what are the things that we are picking up on in this conversation and that we're going to take away with, with us? Um, so Avia, would you like to say something? Um, over to you. Hey, um, yeah, that was great. Hearing from everyone was um, really amazing. Um, and I forgot to say thank you for having me. This is like a really rich conversation. Um, but um, I guess like one of the things that the, the thread and one of the things I kind of missed out on and which I probably just like, um, you know, probably just implied, but, I, you know, to be explicit, I think it is really important to, to ground uh, prison abolition the way I see it as fundamentally an anti-capitalist project and it's something I didn't touch on before um, because, you know, I just take it for granted a lot of the time. But I think it's really important to, to say that actually, um, you know, uh, one of the things that I get concerned about sometimes is when we talk about abolition, I know I'm talking about revolution. But I don't always know if everyone else is talking about revolution. And I just want to be clear about that. <laughs> and also when we're talking about, you know, the prison industrial complex, we're talking about one part of capitalism. But we want to get rid of all of it, not just one bit. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And it's a particular way in which capitalism functions that is, is very dangerous for us, um, but it's not the only part. And so I guess like picking up on the threads what everyone was talking about that kind of um, I thought it was really important to kind of like say that explicitly because sometimes I feel that that gets missed in in our abolitionist project in the way we talk um, and and what you know being clear about what we mean when we're talking about um, abolition so uh, yeah I guess I don't want to say too much because I'm really really keen to hear from from other people um, and from from the audience but I just wanted to like yeah say that for me very clearly <laughs> thank you yeah i think it's it's super important and it also um it really uh brings home the the challenge or the task or the the breadth of of this struggle right that that in order to bring about revolution in order to really be anti-capitalist we have to commit to really changing the way that we are you know in our personal lives in our in our public lives in in our communal lives and um i think sometimes people can maybe understand oh yeah you know i can i can understand that that prisons and policing and carcerality and surveillance don't work um but it's kind of an extra leap to think about capitalism. And I think that, that it's really important for us as abolitionists to be really clear about, about that. So thank you. Um, and also, I guess, um, Ayutomi, you might want to come in here too, either about capitalism or about the, the abolition of prisons um, or anything at all. Yeah, I'm happy to come in here about capitalism because like, honestly, any, any concern that people think they have about sex work, all of those concerns are enabled by capitalism and they're enabled as well, obviously, by patriarchy and by colonialism and structural ableism, but they are first and foremost enabled by capitalism and putting, putting clients away in prisons and putting the wrong types of sex workers in prisons is not going to do, it's not doing anything around preventing those concerns of how sex workers are actually harmed in sex work and in the sex industry. Like what would actually make a difference is the abolishment of sex work and honestly the move to a full, not the abolishment of sex work, sorry, the abolishment of capitalism and the full move to a something approaching a gift economy where people's, people's basic needs like housing and like food um, like clothing, like education, like health, all of those things are 
just met and there is no pressure to have to contribute labor um there's no way of that being violently coerced um if it's even in but yeah <laughs> that's essentially all i wanted to say i think you'll find like most people involved in some form of sex organizing is is like anti-capitalist because yeah thank you very much um so we don't have any questions from the audience so far um and i i kind of want to throw it out again to you all to see if there's anything else that you wanted to say i think chelsea <laughs> you have something yeah um so the comment about it being a, a firmly anti-capitalist project i just wanted to kind of dig into that a little bit because when we think about police and prisons who are they for who are they intended to protect and who do they punish? So as far as property, police in certain neighborhoods protect property. In West Westminster, you know, that you got police sitting all in front of Buckingham Palace, they all all over Windsor just protecting it, making sure it's good. But other property, when they cruising through Nine Hill or when they cruising through certain areas, they're not protecting that. They're occupying that. That's an occupying force. So the reality is this same, the same institution is showing you its class allegiance. It's showing you that it prioritizes property over people, clearly, because I'll shoot you for stealing something. I'll take your life over stuff your your life essence which could never be restored over stuff iphones and chairs and hotels and stuff it's ridiculous but this is the reality so when we look at it in that terms it's not a leap to talk about abolitionists you know ab abolition as being anti-capitalist because the reality is police are have no interest in protecting poor people none mm -mm. They, they 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 control poor people and protect the rich from the poor from us rising up uh, against the class exploitation and just the last point i want to bring out is also firmly a white an anti white supremacist um framework because prisons come from a long legacy of racialization of racializing certain groups in order to justify oppressing them marginalizing them you know, wrecking them, uh, you know, take just taking their control. And this can go all the way back to the serfdoms here in Britain and in and, and Roman times. Like the whole purpose of racializing a group is so you can justify doing whatever you want to them. So we, we, we're fighting a long legacy. Like we're in a long legacy of warriors. You know, this is not a new idea. It's not new, you know, we're just using different language. And that's really freeing for me because you, you're joining a stream as opposed to starting from scratch. Absolutely, thank you. I think uh, I think one of the things that that I've learned, um, you know, I mean, I'm always learning about abolition, and I'm always becoming more and more abolitionist. And I think, um, you know, the first time I said I was an abolitionist versus me saying it now you know i'm coming from a different place and i and i hope to continue coming from a different place and one of the most recent kind of um conceptual or like you know really important learnings that i um have gained is by by listening to and reading ruth wilson gilmore who speaks really about this problem of innocence um and i and so i also want um people to go away uh you know after this uh, after this panel, um, and really thinking about prisons as not just a problem for innocent people who shouldn't be there, right? But as a problem for thought, as a problem for all of us. Um, 
because often we say, okay, well, women, uh, women are victims of this and that and that, and that's why they shouldn't be in prison. And poor people are victims of capitalism and this and that, and that's why they shouldn't be in prison. And black pe- there's nothing wrong with black people. Black people are not criminals, so they shouldn't be in prison. And I think that sometimes we, um, you know, and, and Ayutomi has been talking about this as well, like the good, the good sex work or the bad sex work or this victim narrative. And I think that often, we um, frame these conversations on like, you know, innocent people shouldn't be punished in, the, in this kind of disproportionate, terrible way. Um, but what is really interesting um, that I found is, is what does it look like to really challenge yourself so that I don't, I don't care if this person is innocent or not, but I know that punishment is, is not an adequate or responsible or useful way um, of reacting to or um, moving forward in the face of that harm. Um, so it's not even, it's, it's not based on whether or not this person is deserving of this violence. Nobody is deserving of this violence. And actually what abolitionists are calling for, what abolitionists are trying to create in their everyday lives and trying to work towards um, this sort of horizon um, of a world in which, in, you know, that this binary of innocent and guilty, uh, which has been enshrined literally in law, um, no longer serves as a kind of organizing tool for, for how we relate to, to ourselves and to other people. So I actually have one question from an audience member and then I think we will wrap up. Um, so I have a question specifically with regard to the decriminalization of marijuana, which Chelsea has alluded to. I personally feel as though this movement um, has only been spurred by rich white folk, hence why this movement has taken off. What room does that leave for change to trickle down for black or brown folk in a system designed to favor white supremacy? Um, so I'm happy for Chelsea to answer this specifically, but also coming from a drug policy background, um, white folks who are rich have been calling for legalization of marijuana so that they can benefit from it financially. Black and brown people have been calling for decriminalization of marijuana and, um, and other drugs um, so that they can access safety from criminalization, but also in terms of safe supply, also in terms of um, uh, the, the like being able to consume drugs as they, as people do all over the world um, in ways that are actually safer than in a criminalized um, and punitive environment. The war on drugs tries to end drug use um, um, and and tries to uh, kind of extract money as much money as possible from this criminalization of drug use when in fact what drug policy advocates black and brown and poor and queer and um, deviant sex workers and, and, and all sorts of people who have been um, really uh, demanding um, ways in which to live their lives freely without criminalization have been calling for decrim, have been calling for an end to the criminalization of people who use drugs an end to the harms caused by the war on drugs. Um, and so, yes, rich white folk are really gaining traction and moving forward for legalization so that they can create a legal market um, and benefit off of the continued exploitation of black and brown people. Um, and so it's absolutely um, imperative that we all, as abolitionists and otherwise, um, recognize that the people who are most at risk of criminalization through the war on drugs of punishment um, by the state um, are given access to uh, legal markets when they when they when they do occur um, so that they can also be involved in that people are still in prison in Canada and um, despite cannabis being legal um, or there being a legal market for cannabis and so these are the kinds of ways in which you are absolutely right black and brown people w- won't receive anything trickling down because it's not it's not for them um, it's for for rich white people to to, to kind of gain um, and extract so this is where the, t- the kinds of reforms that we're calling for as abolitionists are really, really important. Um, and I'm just gonna pass on maybe to Chelsea Avia or um, Ayutomi just to, to kind of say something else um, 
maybe a final word about what we need to be demanding right now. Um, and this this is a great example in terms of um, in terms of like cannabis legalization to think about actually the reform that we need to be demanding is decrim, um, and we need to be demanding um, you know an end to this to this war on drugs that 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 is really deadly for, for all of us, but particularly for black and brown people, particularly for people who are using drugs. Um, you know, only 15 to 20% of whom um, experience dependency or addiction or problematic use, which is, is really overrepresented in this whole narrative of the war on drugs. So I'm gonna pass to Chelsea first and then Avia and then Ayutomi. And so it's a goodbye from me, unless I have any quick things to say about anyone else's responses. Thank you, everyone. Just this has just been amazing. I've been scribbling like crazy in my notebook, just like writing down quotes from y'all and so excited to be here. So thank you, everyone, for attending. Um, just wanted to say briefly that fighting for abolition, Ruth Wilson Gilmore gives us a term, non-reformist reforms. And so if we split that so it doesn't just sound like a bunch of words and we put non-reformists over here and reforms over here. What is a reform? Something that changes the system today, okay? What is non-reformist? Something that doesn't give the system more money, more control, or more power. So for example, legalizing, let's take the marijuana issue. Legalizing marijuana gives the government more control Oh, because they set the regulations. They have more power because they decide who can do it and who can't. And they also have more money because now they're going to take taxes and get money off of it, right? So we don't want that. We want a non-reformist reform. So as long as it's not giving a state institution more money, more power, or more control, and it's improving the lives of the people who are directly impacted by the issue, it will be more positive. So the more that we look at issues and try to like kind of line it up like that. Is it a reformist reform or a non-reformist reform? Is it giving the state more money, more power, more control? We don't want it. Less, we do. So that's like a quick rule of thumb you can use to check to see if a liberal reform is abolitionist or not. Thanks everyone. Avia, yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Sorry, um, I did see there's a couple more questions um, that I'm actually going to try and weave the, an answer to. Yeah, let me let me um, <laughs> let me read them out for everybody, and then yeah. So I I did just see these. Um, so the first is thank you so much for sharing your ideas and learned experiences. I'm wondering about the idea of removing government power and the parallels that draw with right wing people who believe the government should have less power and control, and the way that trans that translates into removing responsibility to others and social resources from the most in need with the idea that people should work harder to survive on their own. What kind of structure can we build that means that social resources and care within the community is global and not only pockets of localities? Really great question. And the second is, hi, thank you so much for this for such an interesting talk. Are there steps that can get put in place en route to the abolition of prisons to ease the process, especially when considering people's hesitations about sex convictions and murder by making them spaces for education, such as people convicted on sex offenses, having to take mandatory consent lessons, or would that further entrench the prison system? Hope that makes sense, thank you. So, um, two really interesting and important questions. Um, yeah, Avia and Ayutomi, if you wanted to feel free to respond to those. If not, you know, it's important to share questions. And I think that those are questions that we're all answering. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so the first um, question, yeah, really important um, around the parallels between what we may be uh, proposing around um a life outside of the state and the parallels that might have with like kind of um right wing sort of um ideologies um and yeah there, there, there's not you know there there is some crossover there between some people who want to like take all of the money and the power away from the state so that they can just live as individuals um but i guess the difference that i'm i'm proposing that i'm interested in is not an individualistic um kind of way of being outside of the state but 
I guess one of the interesting things and that has actually kind of um, challenged me recently, you know, I, I grew up kind of with um, the National Health Service, which is like the bastion of like, you know, um, one of the most amazing things that kind of, I guess, left wing working class labor organized politics has achieved. And it is great. Having a National Health Service is great. Not having to pay for healthcare is absolutely fantastic. Um, and it's something that, you know, we, we, we take for granted that that is, that is where we should all be heading in terms of our politics. And actually recently I've kind of learned a little bit more about what was going on before the National Health Service in working class communities. And they, uh, some working class communities set up these things called like friendlies, um, <laughs> friendly society, sorry, um, where they would put in a little bit of money each um you know to have a doctor for you know the all the workers in their village or whatever and actually the medical professions really hated this because um it meant that they were beholden the doctors were beholden to the community and the community got to define to the doctor we we need you to do this we want you to do it like that we want a holistic way of doing things there were like centers even, even into the First part of the 20th century whole health centers that were interested in these holistic ways of doing things and that were non-authoritarian and and if you think about the way in which the national health services works now in terms of these huge health trusts and how do you create accountability how do people define what kind of health care they need with these huge bureaucratic state-led kind of ideas of what health care looks like and actually those you know those earlier systems all died out when the national health service came in um, but actually, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of things to say about, you know, when your health professionals or the people that have those skills are actually are defined, um, by the community about in terms of what they need and what they need for you. And it's a collaborative process rather than a doctor knows best process that's going to tell you what you need. There's actually a lot interesting in that. So I guess, you know, my, my understanding of that is in answer to your question is like, I do think that you know, through um, collectively coming up with these ideas and collectively sharing and pooling our resources and kind of touching on the second comment as well, um, I guess the mutual aid stuff that has come up through COVID-19, is it the first time that COVID's even been mentioned? I'm not sure. <laughs> um, you know, actually has, has shown that it is possible to create these systems, to create these systems of support and work together. Um, and then just one thing on that second question that I wanted to, to say, like, I do think that communities, mutual aid, collect, collectivizing resources is the way forward, not individualizing. But, you know, in terms of what do we do with these, these people that are perpetrating serious amounts of harm, I suggest you read, um, uh, there's an organization, I think they're called Generation Five. Yeah. I have that have have a have a a proposal for how to end um, child sexual um, abuse in communities within five generations, and I'm just going to finish on um, just suggesting you read up on them, read up on their what they're saying on and their proposal to kind of understand how we can. It's not necessarily going to happen tomorrow, but we can have we can put strategies in place to do this over a period of time. Um, the uh, link I just put into the chat is about um, transformative justice and one of the readings attached there is um, from Generation 5. So that's a really, um, yeah, I, th I think it's important to recognize that a lot of people have been grappling with these very same questions and writing about them and sharing them. So there's always a text that is kind of thinking about those things um, that, that we can recommend and that you can kind of find in your research. So it is important to, to read and to read collectively, read with others so that it's not um, an individual um, kind of problem or kind of task. Um, read with people who are interested, um, discuss it, think about it together, make up your own mind um, and do your own sort of experiments and thought experiments. Um, Ayutomi, do you have anything else that you wanted to say um, before we close? Yeah, I just wanted to uh, address the first question or the question by Eli King. And I just wanted to touch upon that, um, like the parallels between what we're advocating for and what 
like right wing libertarians advocate for. And it's times like these I like to I like to think about how the term libertarian, because that's essentially what we're talking about here, didn't actually originate in right wing politics, actually originated in left wing politics. So you can see there's a very vested interest on both sides of the political spectrum between right wing people and people who are left wing, but believe in authoritarian state control, um, you know, have a vested interest in saying, you know, you can either be individual, but in the in right wing politics, or you can have all of this um, community support, but it has to come from a far away centralized um, power, whether that's a um, vanguard party or that's just the government. Um, and, you know, we don't really want either of those things, if that makes sense. It's very possible to have these um, local independent community led interventions and services that are anti-capitalist in nature. We don't need to um, go the way of the right-wingers who say that if you have enough money, you can do whatever you want, um, but it's all individualized. And we don't have to go the way of, we need to put everything into a big centralized um, government and hope that they can take care of all of us communally. We don't, we don't need to do either of those things. So mm. that's all I really wanted to add. Thank you. Um, I think to close, I just also wanted to say, um, sometimes people feel like, and in, this, in Isabel's question, like the process needs to be eased. But I just want to remind you that the prison system doesn't function in the way it says it does. The people who are like, we, we spoke about murder and sexual abuse. Those things are happening outside of prison walls all of the time. And so in terms of like easing the process, you know, abolition is not about this huge rupture that means that we suddenly have to deal with issues that we're not dealing with anymore because they used to be dealt with by the by the prison. Um, because the, the problem is what we are saying is as abolitionists, we see that these problems are not solved by the prison, by the policing, by the surveillance systems, by carcerality. And so, yes, we have to think about consent culture. We have to share resources. We have to find ways to change culture. But people are leaving prison every day and harm is happening outside of prison all the time. And so the idea that um, you know, the decarceration or the emptying of prisons would somehow be felt um, on an individual level um, and need to be eased is also a kind of abstraction of what, what would actually happen or what is actually happening. And, and, and in, um, in kind of finding ways to, uh, you know, um, make prisons more educational or kind of reform them in ways that can slowly bring us closer to abolition rather than um, as fast as possible, as quickly as possible, because people are dying and being harmed and um, um, people's lives are being destroyed by prisons, by, by carcerality. We have to really think about um, yes, there is an urgency to transforming harm, but that happens right now and it happens in your life, it happens in our life, it happens within and, and outside of the prison, right? Um, but that shouldn't stop or, or kind of um, interrupt the process of abolition, if that makes sense. Um, okay, I don't wanna take up too much time, so I'm going to uh, say goodbye from me, um, goodbye from everybody else. <laughs> and Joe, if there's anything you wanna say on behalf of the Students' Union. I just wanna say thank you so much. It has been such an honor to work with all four of you um, and to have such a breadth of knowledge and experiences that you've shared with us and shared with our students. Thank you so much for taking the time um, to talk about an issue which is clearly very close to all of our hearts. Um, and can be quite difficult to talk about. So just also wanted to acknowledge that and to encourage students to also, if you've been touched by any of this, practice self-care, because that's also a radical act. Um, this is something that we obviously care about a lot. And thank you again so much to all of our speakers. And I'm just so happy that we got to finish our Black History Month on such a radical and important topic. Um, please do check out the resources that Chelsea um, and Imani have spoken about. We'll be sending an email round to all the attendees um, with, where you can check out their social media platforms um, and some other bits of their work. 
Um, if any of the students, you have friends who couldn't make it, don't worry, we have recorded this. So we're going to upload that and share it because that's the most important thing is that all of our activism is as accessible as possible. So thank you again to all of our speakers. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, and I hope you all have a very wonderful evening.